everyone. <laughs> uh, it's a, a huge pleasure uh, for me to introduce Simon Watney, a uh, highly influential gay activist, um, curator, writer, and he's tonight going to talk to us about Outrage, uh, a, an activist organisation that he set up in 1990. Thank you very yeah? much indeed. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to just immediately, just for a moment, think back to what Marlene was saying, because I feel absolutely so sympathetic to what she said at one point. She was talking about being an individual here and having something called the, the political moment, the conjunction there. What is it? I, I, I would certainly not want to be, I'm not the founder of Outrage. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, in, that, in the sense that Outrage was about a moment in time, it was about hundreds of people coming together from all over the country who had enough. I was one of three people who certainly called a small meeting at my flat, <laughs> from which something emerged. And maybe without false modesty, I'd like to talk a little bit about how it is that we gain confidence. Marlene spoke about being, putting on the armour to go to art school. Uh, many of us, for different reasons, have had to put on armour at different stages in our lives to find self-confidence. I've actually never spoken about outrage before in public, so um, I'm very pleased to be asked tonight, so I'm very grateful to us, to, to, I'm very grateful to all the organisers for being given this opportunity. Outrage initially was the reaction by three friends to a situation we felt around us. Um, 20 years ago, um, in 1990, 1991, and um, that's halfway back in my life, back to my initial activism, in the moment of gay liberation, the very first foundational moment right, of gay identity politics, of gay and lesbian identity politics in this country. Uh, when I was a student and going up to London to the Arts Lab. <laughs> so all sorts of threads come together at these events, don't they? Probably for many of us. Um, the events 20 years ago, at any rate, behind outrage were triggered by one particular murder, but there have been many murders, as there are always many murders. Murders that are promptly forgotten in the next day's newspapers. This was a man called Michael Booth. He was an actor, he was in Doctor Who. Uh, he was just one of many people being killed in the climate of early Thatcherism, which was a climate I hardly need to remind you of resurgent bigotry and hatred. Um, when the recriminalisation of male homosexuality was well on the cards at that particular moment in time. Michael Booth was attacked by six men in a park. Um, he survived the attack for about 24 hours. He was beaten up so badly, I think his left foot was practically severed from his leg. Um, his murderers were never found either. Um, but for me, it's all linked back inseparably, I have to say, to members of Gay Liberation 20 years earlier, when as a rather shy, student uh, 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 in your political meetings unable to speak, I first found my self-confidence with a lot of older people around me. Um, I was born just four years after the war and came from a one-parent, working-class family, council estate background. I found my political voice in CND, the peace movement, I used to go to anarchist book readings in Chalk Farm, <laughs> wandering around London trying to find my way through the 60s, like everybody else of that period. I went to many left-wing groups. I went to many churches as well, for that matter, in my teens. And I'd remind you, if perhaps it's, it's necessary to remind you, that that period was far from being hospitable to uh, young lesbians and gay men. Um, the left was, at that time, obsessively, of course, caught up, and rightly to some extent, obviously, with questions of class, but at that point, to the almost total exclusion to questions of race, gender, or sexuality. And all of us here who've been involved in different ways in the intersecting struggles of, against racism and against misogyny and against homophobia, um, we'll see how that, we'll, be, we'll know how those debates have, been, have, have overlapped. People could smile today at the naivety of first stage one, as Stuart Hall would have called it, identity politics. Well, we all have to start somewhere, <laughs> don't we, to come to our oh-so-sophisticated 21st century positions where we feel we can just be ourselves and let go of the handles that sometimes we quite painfully acquire for ourselves. Um, I 
been in something of a public figure since the early 70s in the lesbian and gay movement in this country, insofar as I'd written for the gay press from the very beginning. Um, I'd been involved 40 years ago in setting up the very first gay liberation group in Brighton. They're having their gay pride march this coming Saturday, 40 years on from our first uh, naive, but so, um, yeah, so we started it off down there. Um, so activism for me in those days was framed in an opposition between coming up to London and meeting all these extraordinary Maoists and scary people in some ways, angry people certainly, shouting and yelling. Um, because, uh, uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, very funny duddy people, to my way of thinking as a teenager, involved in what I saw as reformist groups, like the Campaign for Homosexual Equality. Um, we were activists. We were going to be picketing and lobbying outside British home stores where our friends had lost their jobs for being on TV for talking about being gay. So I think I was fairly typical of the generation of the early 70s who went on to found the community organisations. Many thousands of people who did thankless work all around the country through the 70s, um, setting up lesbian and gay switchboards with the national networks, anything and everything from local newspapers to support groups to counselling groups, trying to help people who've been damaged by homophobia in their own backyards, through to you know, hobby clubs, stamp collecting clubs, walking clubs, whatever, you name it. Um, the 70s, in that sense, was for all of us foundational, inventing things as we went along. It wasn't only local either, it wasn't only British. We had links into Europe and far overseas, all of us, in our different kinds of struggles. I joined a group called Gay Left, which was a political reading group. We published a journal. Uh, we organised the annual Lesbian and Gay Socialist Conference together with um, various lesbian friends of ours. I helped organise the very first organisation in this country. Of Got exhibition with a, with a strap line lesbian and gay on it now, I think about it, in the mid-70s. Um, again, people can laugh at that now. Not every queer artist today would want to be categorised in that way, and I quite respect that. But it was important to do that at the time, just like Marlene was talking about the importance of the work by her friends at the time. Um, I would like to say, however, that in the subsequent history of, of cultural politics, we were a group of young people interested in Freud and in Gramsci. It was exactly the same time Stuart Hall was founding the Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies in Birmingham. One of the members of our group, Richard Dyer, was a student of Stuart's there. I also went to Stuart's seminars in the early 70s. Um, that takes me a bit off, off board from where I want to go to today, though. I, the most important of those community organisations, I think, was Switchboard. It gave people, let me go Switchboard, 24-hour phone service. Information, housing, advice, you've been beaten up, how do I handle the police? Giving people confidence, community building. I was the training officer there when I was very young, when I first moved to London in 74, 75. Um, so, although I went into teaching, um, I was teaching photography with Victor Bergen for years in London at that stage of my life. Um, I was, as I say, very much involved in lesbian and gay politics. Um, I therefore inevitably got very much involved in AIDS issues very, very early on. I set, helped set up the first health education group, uh, the Terence Higgins Trust, in 1984-85, and subsequently various other groups and so on and so forth. I had some confidence, not because I was born with confidence, but because I learned it with friends out of struggle. Um, and therefore, by the time that Mrs. Thatcher, uh, zooming back, zooming forward a little bit, by the time Mrs. Thatcher had come along, you know, and wrecked the boat, um, um, many of us, I think, had a political identity which was not going to be easily intimidated. Um, this is the very first demonstration of outrage. Um, as I say, I, I called a meeting with just two friends, two younger friends of mine. One had been a, a media studies student, Keith Alcorn, and the other worked in the gay press as a young journalist um, called Chris Woods. And I, we were all mates. We'd worked together in HIV work in the mid-'80s. Um, I think we just felt had the feeling that enough was enough. Violence rates were rising in the late-'80s. Um, 
So we decided, having had some discussions, to call a public meeting at the Lesbian and Gay Centre, which is what we did. Uh, we phoned around, this is pre-internet of course, and about two or three hundred people turned up. It was a very angry meeting. I spoke, Chris spoke, Chris Keith spoke, and the result was an organisation, um, an open-ended organisation. But it was, this, our, first, our first demonstration a few weeks later was actually in a public laboratory, which may sound, sound sleazy, but it's where a lot of policemen have been going to entrap people deliberately pretending to be gay in order to, um, to up the, um, the arrest statistics. But for, for someone like me, and, and, and not just me, but many people like me, I, I had first experience, had experience already of very organized activism, activism like ACT UP in America, um, with affinity groups, where people had lawyers on hand, where people were prepared for being arrested and not to be frightened. Um, I was very well aware from 1989, 1990, of the emerging queer nation movement in America as well, of the pink patrols to protect people on the streets. Um, I was involved in media politics as well, so the idea of something which was going to be camera grabbing was also very important. Um, there was a whole new world of queer theory moving over the whole, you know, coming up and arising at that very moment in time, debates about outing and so on. I was already an old fogey then, so by that stage I was 40 or 41 or something or thereabouts. I was a kind of old statesman, dare I say, of that particular movement at that particular time. I'd also, just by chance in 1989, been in Berlin at exactly the time when the war was coming down, doing some workshops around sacred sex education. Um, so for me, outrage was absolutely about sustaining the energy which I got as a young man myself from gay liberation, about a politics which was maybe muddled, anarchic, chaotic, but it was going to be inclusive. I wanted to encourage people to come along to gain the sort of confidence that I'd been given as a very young man 20 years earlier. It was a good cop, bad cop routine, really, because a year earlier, the Stone Group had been formed. Um, Ian McKellen is its very eloquent mouthpiece as a lobbying group. Um, in any form of, 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 of radical politics, I think always you're going to need lobbyists and you're going to need activists, and they're never going to get on <laughs> by the nature of the world. From the lobbyist's point of view, activist organisations are unruly, they're chaotic, they can't set policy, they can't measure aims or goals. Conversely, from the activist point of view, from the, from the activist point of view, lobbying groups are going to look hierarchical, they're not going to be democratic or representative, and they're going to be accused of being elitist or whatever. Um, that's fine. That's fine in any political struggle, because that's how the world is. We had Derek John as our crazy spokesman. I was very lucky. I'd known Derek since, oh, I don't know how long, always. I'd worked on all his films from GB onwards as a script advisor and script worker. Um, and he was a very dear friend of mine. And Derek's help to us, both as a fundraiser and as a public figure, was enormous and incalculable, I think. Um, Derek Jarman over here, Ian McKellen over here, they were never going to get on. Mine, because I'm a diplomat, <laughs> I, I didn't want anything to appear just as a personality spat as far as it could be avoided. Um, but I did think it was important that we did have someone who could represent something which was going to be more inclusive um, than the Stonewall group appeared to be at the beginning. To be perfectly honest, whilst outrage was all about age of consent issues, anti-homophobia politics, um, sexual politics, for me it had another secret agenda, as it were. I was involved in community development issues. What I cared about more than anything else was HIV transmission. Uh, we're talking about a moment before the development of combination therapy, which keeps me alive and perhaps some other people here today. Uh, people were dying, Derek was dying, all sorts of people had already died, though they actually the, 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 
the, the great death toll of the early 90s was still a little way away. I thought it was terribly important at that moment in time in 1990 to, to work back in the kind of identity politics which is so often sneered at today, giving people a sense of confidence in themselves. The kind of confidence which, in, which would enable them to keep sustaining safer sex over time, to keep themselves and one another alive. So for me, outrage had a, a, a public rhetoric which was indeed about outrage to do with anti-gay violence, to do with the age of consent, to do with Section 28, the threat of recriminalisation. For me, all of that was grist to the mill of HIV education, of trying to do community development work, um, which would hopefully keep the transmission level to a missing at, at um, Spiccadilly Circus, when some boy clambered right up to the very top of the statue and had a snog with Eros. Um, it was memorable and it was significant, not only because it was a great fresh opportunity and, and, and lots of the press did cover it, but because also Eros is, after all, about the sexiest statue in London. <laughs> and, not only that, of course, it's not, only, it's not just Eros, is it? It's the monument to the 7th Earl of Shaftesbury, <laughs> the great campaigner against child labour. It is actually a monument within the politics of, 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 of the, within the history of radical politics in this country, which we often easily forget. Um, and the same um, traditions that bring us together here today from all our different backgrounds, I think, uh, were brought together at that point. Outrage had a number of different affinity groups, very much more on the kind of American model to provide support. Um, with the policing intelligence group, PIG, the Whores of Babylon group, tacking religious homophobia, perverts undermining state scrutiny, <laughs> pussy tackling censorship. Um, working in relation to the police was terribly important at that time, and, it, and outrage did very quickly give birth to the first major um, organisation on the community-based organisation in direct dialogue with the Met about police violence, and about anti-gay violence in London. And that was again a, a, a measurable achievement that I think was terribly important. In 1991 we also picketed and had a big demonstration. I think there's a picture of that here. Somewhere. Oh here we go, yes, somewhere like that. Um, that's not it, never mind, against Amnesty International, which had decided at that very point in time, the height of all this horror and the epidemic, that they were not going to regard lesbians and gays in the developing world as, as candidates for political support, uh, which seemed very remarkably um, narrow-minded. Um, and many of my more traditional left-wing friends said, you can't pick it Amnesty. <laughs> <laughs> but we did, and it was successful, and eventually they did actually change the policy. Um, not just because of what outrage did, perhaps, but it, we were certainly one of the noisier embarrassments, I think, buzzing in their ears. Sometimes it's important to be a noisy embarrassment, and not just an intellectual or an artist, or all the other things that we are on different days of the week. Um, outrage, like all the different community organisations I've ever been involved in, was hardly a, a smooth ride. We were vulnerable. We were vulnerable in particular to certain kinds of entryism, just as gay liberation had been 20 years earlier. Entryism from the old far-left parties trying to hijack a broad community movement to their particular, generally narrower, agendas. <clears throat> I'd be the last person in the world to want to displace or deny the importance of class politics alongside all the other issues I've touched on today. But I was certainly determined in outrage that that wasn't going to happen. <clears throat> and if I did have any particular personal role in outrage, it certainly wasn't a major public role. I didn't ever set myself up for that in any way, shape or form. But at the meetings, the regular weekly open meetings, I did indeed play a big role in trying to prevent people from the hard left taking outrage over the traditional problem of the entryists. It got very violent. It, not only physically violent, but I mean emotionally violent. Um, I don't like emotion. I don't like screaming matches anymore. I'm sure than any of you do. But sometimes it's really important to talk people down, 
people who've been trained, in a sense, in their own little cadres to infiltrate and to take over communitarian organisations run by groups who often don't have a lot of confidence. So I think to the extent that outrage didn't just take a narrow party line, again, I, I, I think it was successful in its day. Um, after Derek's death in 93, 94 now, um, the mission continued to be one of campaigning for the repeal of Section 28, which indeed, under the later Blair government, Section 28 was repealed. The age of consent finally was equalised. The goals that outrage, the broad specific goals that outrage wanted to achieve, have now been achieved. And in conclusion, that just takes me on to the to, to a sort of to a point that I'd like to make, perhaps in general, as I see it, about activism as an old crock. It seems to me that there are, to, to, gen, to make one of those dreadful statements, there are two kinds of. There are two kinds of activism. There's the kind of activism which has a specific single goal. I want this. Okay? And everyone gets together, whatever this may be, and you target the relevant institutions, you campaign, you lobby, you do all the things that are needed until this is achieved. We can all think of particular examples, I'm sure, of that kind of activism. Outrage wasn't like that. It was a different sort of activism. It was a generalised activism, an activism which is why what Marlene said struck home to me so strongly. It was an activism about a moment in time. It was about being completely scared and pissed off and um, angry in 1990 in this country with what was going on, with the epidemic, with violence, with homophobia, on a, on a galloping scale. I'd written a book in 1985 called Policing Desire, which was about the, the, um, the press coverage of the epidemic. So perhaps in a sense I've been too polluted by having to read the tabloid press day after day, month after month, year after year. I've been very much a, a spokesperson on behalf of the AIDS movement in this country in the mid-80s. So I was certainly myself very powerfully motivated at that particular moment in time. Outrage then achieved its, its limited goals eventually, I suppose, but it hasn't achieved its general goals because those goals Alas, probably, it can never be entirely achieved. You can never legislate against maniacs, against people whose lives are so motivated by fear and horror of desire and love and difference that they go out and kill and blow people up and do the terrible things that happen week after week. But we can aim to reduce those, the dangers and vulnerability that the rest of us stand from that kind of person. Um, and if outrage did anything, and it's lived on, I suppose, not to criticise Peter Tatchell, who's a very remarkable individual, it became, in a sense, his one-man band. It gave Peter a platform and an organisation, um, and that's fine. But that wasn't why I think we set up outrage, and Peter wasn't one of the founders of outrage. Um, it survived to this day as an important voice and a brave and courageous voice at times on a wide range of issues, identifying homophobia all over the place. Um, in every institution, from the Church of England through to non-Christian churches as well. Um, I think outreach has changed, however, from the organisation that I helped set up, together with those two younger friends back in 1990, um, we're always going to need activism, both of the specific kind and the broad kind, um, and that's how I'll leave it. Thank you very much.